Thank you, Janice. I also like to congratulate Mary and Jeff for the award, and I really learned an awful lot from your talks. Uh, before I start, I like to thank my wife and my daughter. They are in the audience. Without their support and uh, understanding over the years, I would not have been able to have so much fun with the single talk. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, let me begin with the peculiar properties of light. You know, when you switch on, when you go into the room, you have light. So this is some other definition. Now, light is in fact a particle. When we are looking at something, actually all the photons are coming in the eyes, right? And they have a name uh, called photon, right? And it actually carries some energy, okay? And it also behaves like a wave, and that is the, really the dilemma of nature, something which is kind of variable. Now, the other property of light is that all the photons carry energy, and the energy is determined by its wavelength. Right? I buy its vehicle. Now, strangely enough, all the photons travel at the same speed. Whether it uh, carries a lot of energy or carries very little energy, they are as fast as each other. Okay? So, these are the really peculiar uh, properties of light or photons. So, what is the wavelength? Right? I mean, it's kind of a, a benchmark of a photon. Let's imagine a photon propagating in space, travel in, in a wave, such as a sine wave of oscillating electromagnetic field as described by Maxwell. Okay? Then the distance it travels at a given interval is the wavelength. So that's the wavelength. Okay? So now if you consider yeah, an infrared photon is a smart car, right, with a, with a wavelength of a thousand nanometer. Then a blue light photon would be a sedan, right, it's a little bit here, here's more energy. And if you go to X-ray, you have a truck, you have a truck. But if you go to the gamma ray, you have a bad truck. <laughs> so therefore, synchrotron can be regarded as just a car dealer, has a cars of all sizes. They all travel at the speed of light. Okay, speed limit, 300,000 kilometers per second. They all travel at that speed, and that's light. Now, what is a synchrotron? So on the left, you can see uh, this is the uh, building that housed the uh, Canadian night source. The one and only synchrotron in Canada it is, in the, uh, is in Saskatoon. Now, on this side, you can, this is sort of a ground level view of the building. The building is just like a stadium. It's very big. And inside, you can see this accelerator, uh, sometimes called the storage room. So here, electrons are forced to circulate. Right? They're forced to circulate at very high speed, close to the speed of light. And when that happens, when the electrons are bent, whenever they are bent with a, by a mallet, and then you can see uh, there's a really bright beam coming out uh, from the synchrotron. And this is the synchrotron light, right? It's a really bright beam of light, and it's highly collimated, all right? And also, within this light beam, you have all the photons, just like, so this is the car dealer, right? You have infrared, you have x-ray, you have UV, you have visible, you have everything. All are within this fine uh, beam of light. Okay, so another way of looking at light, or synchrotron light, is to go to what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Okay, and here, uh, historically, we like to give names to light uh, with different names. For example, we have infrared, we have visible, we have ultraviolet, UV, and X-ray, and gamma ray, and so on. Okay, so we give them names. In fact, we can also match the wavelength of all different light with the size of object. For example, the size of bacteria is comparable to the wavelength of visible, right? Say, a water molecule, uh, its dimension is comparable to the wavelength of X-rays. And the nucleus, its size is comparable to the wave of gamma rays. So this is one of the very interesting properties of nature. 
Now I'm saying all of this because light can see objects. You use light to see objects, right? And only when the dimension or the object is comparable or smaller than its wavelength, right? If the object is too small, then you cannot see it if your wavelength is too large, okay? So let me illustrate this by doing a measure of a, of a daily object. What is the most popular daily object? Possibly a loony, right? <laughs> so let's look at a loony and what size is it. So let's bring in a pupil, a serura, all right? Pupil serura. And then you can eyeball it looking at the marks in the division. And then you say, haha, this is 2.65 centimeter in diameter. So that's the, uh, then you can do measurements with a ruler of daily object. But how about hair, human hair, which is not finer? If you bring in the same ruler, uh, then you realize that the interval between the division is just too large. So you cannot use a pupil ruler to measure the dimension of of a hair, the size of the hair. So what do you do? You have to find a ruler that has marks, all right, where it has a smaller intervals. You have a finer mark. So that's where the so-called photon ruler comes in. For example, if you want to measure the size of a biological cell, which is typically of the order, uh, say, 0.05 millimeter, or even smaller object like water molecule, right? Now to do that, you, you definitely need a ruler with marks or mark intervals that's smaller than the object itself, so you can measure, right? So this is what the photon, photon ruler comes in, and the wavelength is the interval of the markers that allow you to do proper measurement. So if you want to go to measure a water molecule then, which is a lot smaller, then you need light with much shorter wavelength. Okay? So that's how you uh, do measurements with light. So that's why I call the photon ruler. Now synchrotron, why do we use synchrotron? Because synchrotron is provides all these rulers. Right? You can have whatever size you want. So the next thing is how do we use light to investigate the property of a material? Okay? And light interacts with material in two ways. In fact, they're taking place at the same time. So these two phenomena are occurring at the same time. So first is scattering. Let's say a photon comes in, interact with an atom. So this photon can get bounced in all directions. How it gets bound really depends on the wavelength and the property of the atom, right? Whether it has a lot of electrons or doesn't have a lot of electrons. And when atoms come together, they can form a crystal. So the atom can line up with the crystal to give you lattice planes. And this lattice planes can diffract and scatter the light coherently. And the term for that is diffraction. So if the light we use is correct, it satisfies the so-called diffraction condition, where the lambda is the wavelength, the D is the lattice spacing, and the angle theta is the angle of instance. If that happens, then we can get diffraction spot of the light. And from the diffraction pattern, we'll be able to determine the structure of the material. So what element you have in there, how far they are apart, and so on. So another phenomenon is called absorption. Photon comes in, right, and just like a car crash. So you cannot salvage it. So all the energy is gone. So the energy of the light comes in, it's all absorbed. And the energy goes into the system, right, in the excited state. So this is just like most of the time, the, all the energy the photon has is given off to the system. It would kick an electron from the ground state, so to speak, to the excited state. Just like electron taking an elevator, right? <laughs> so it gives some energy, go from ground state to the excited state. Now in a molecule, the same thing happens. And the excited electron actually can propagate away from the atom, all right? So and then it gets bounced around by the laboring atom, just like a radar. All right. So the information gets bounced back from the laboring atom, and the result of that uh, uh, gives you all the information about the neighborhood. This is the atomic neighborhood. Okay. So therefore, by doing absorption and scattering, you can get a lot of information about the structure on the atomic level. 
Now, here's the sum of the everyday experience of light scattering. And you all know that you have blue sky and you have rainbow after the rain is simple because of light scattering. But in the laboratory, things can get more complicated. But it's still light scattering, but you can use it to do something. So here I'm going to use the, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2009 as an example. Now this folks won the Nobel Prize because for this study uh, of the structure and function of <coughs> ribosomes. Now ribosome is a very interesting entity. It's the molecular machine that makes proteins, right? So the under, to understand how it functions, you really have to know the structure. And the structure actually was determined using X-ray from the synchrotron. Right? You cannot do it in the laboratory. You really have to use the signature line. So, and these folks figured that out, and they determined a very complex structure. But still, a simple phenomenon, light scattering. Okay? All right. So, here I want to give you another example of X-ray absorption. This is one of the most interesting uh, X-ray image of all time. This is one of the really, very first X-ray uh, radiograph of the hand of Mrs. Rengens, right? The wife of the German physicist who discovered X-rays. Now the reason you actually can see an image is because you have skin, you have flesh, you have bone, and then you have the retina. <coughs> they all absorb X-ray differently. As the result of that, you get contrast, you get image, and you know what's going on, okay? Now, so this really comes down to what I've been doing. Right? <coughs> so I've been using X-ray absorption as a tool to look at all kinds of stuff, okay? Now, X-ray absorption spectroscopy is arguably the most powerful tool of all time, okay? And then I try to convince you this is the case because it's <laughs> element and chemical specific. Well, everything had to do with element, and you and I, we are made up of elements, right? So if you look at an element, then you know everything. In principle, in principle, okay? <laughs> so you can plot the surrounding of an atom in a material or in any given environment. So this is how it works. Okay, when X-ray comes in, if it's with sufficient energy, then you can excite a core electron, such as a 1s electron in any atom, to the purely the unoccupied electronic state, like a uh, unoccupied atomic orbital, okay? So now if you increase, so this is the threshold, right? This is where everything starts. So then if the X-ray energy increases, then you can kick the electron into the continuum. It becomes an excited electron which can travel away <laughs> from the absorbing atom. Okay, when it does that, it gets bounced around by the surrounding atoms, it brings back the information through bad scattering, and because of in interference of the outgoing and bad scatter uh, electrons, all this information got wrapped up or caught accumulated into something we call X-ray absorption spectrum. So in principle, X-ray absorption spectrum contains all the information we want about the neighborhood of the atom that absorbs the X-ray. So, let me just show you an example. Now, this is so-called X-ray absorption spectrum at the edge of silicon, okay? At the edge of silicon. Here, I show you two spectrum, X-ray absorption spectrum of silicon and silicon oxide. They basically have the same structure, but the, in the elemental silicon is surrounded by four silicon atoms. Uh, in silicon oxide, the silicon is surrounded by four oxygen atoms. All right, so as you can see, the absorption spectrum, first of all, you see a increase in the absorption coefficient uh, when the, en uh, uh, the energy that comes in uh, is sufficient to excite the electron. That's the threshold. And that historical is called edge. So X-ray absorption spectroscopy always has to do with edges, right? Because edges tells you what element there is. Because if you see some edge at certain energy, you can only have that element. You cannot have anything else. Okay? All right. So, uh, and then beyond that, all this oxidation beyond the threshold, 
are the information the electron brings back to their floating atom about the surrounding. So the trick is how to analyze it. If you know how to do that, then you know everything about the neighborhood of the atom. All right, so now I just want to illustrate some of the applications with two tiny examples, maybe, all right? One has to do with energy storage involved lithium ion, lithium ion phosphate battery, which is one of the hottest uh, subject of, of this time, all right? And the other has to do with drug delivery. How are we trying to load and load drug and deliver in certain systems? So how do we do, what this got to do with synchrotron, right? And I'll show you what this got to do with synchrotron. Okay? All right. Now most of you know high school chemistry, right? Electro battery operates electrodes, you charge and discharge, and so on, right? Now here, uh, lithium ion phosphate is used as a cathode, all right? Uh, and this is the structure. So basically, you have alternating ion oxygen and phosphorus oxygen uh, polygons, right? So, and then in the space in between, you bring lithium in and out, and that's it. That's your lithium ion battery. And that is it in principle. But we all know the devil is in the detail, right? <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> now, uh, when this battery operates, from time to time, it, there are many, many various phase that are produced. Some people don't even know why they are there, okay? So this is where synchrotron come in. What synchrotron can do is to give each and every one of these guys an identity, an X-ray identity. So then we know well, where they are and try to, we can try to figure out how they are formed, okay? So by doing X-ray absorption spectrum here is the X-ray absorption spectrum or fingerprints of lithium in all these different phases. We can do the same for iron, for phosphorus, and so on. Okay, so that's one thing. You track the possible phases they can occur during the operation of the battery. Now, another is that we can actually study the dynamics of charging and discharging. Now, why, are not, why we are not going to straight cars, to electric cars yet? Because charging is really a problem, right? It takes hours. It takes hours. But if you go to the gas station, even if you want to fill your tank, right, probably five or ten minutes. So understand the dynamics of charging and discharging is really, really important. And synchrotron can help you to do that uh, by doing so-called in situ measurements. That means we are tracking the chemical state of elements in the battery while the battery is operating. Okay? So now here is the scheme of the material at the cathode, right? So on this side and that side are the system where it is fully charged or fully discharged, where here is somewhere in between. So by tracking the chemical state of an element ion while the battery is operating, say when it's charging, and we can see the chemical state of ion in the material is changing when we're doing this measurement as a function of time on the fly, on the fly, that's institute, right? And we can also do the same thing uh, when the system is discharging. That means you, when you put a no on it. And you can study the chemical change in a 2D map as a function of time. And by doing this kind of analysis, you begin to be able to understand how the thing charges up. So this would affect the performance of the material. So the next example has to do with drug delivery in principle, right, in principle. So one of our approach is to try to load some of the drug on some really cheap stuff, right, uh, calcium silicate hydrate, microsphere, right, it, it, they, are, they are everywhere, right, it works. Uh, and the idea is the following. We will start by making this material into microspheres, okay, and it which looks like this. It has a lot of uh, 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 porosity in that. And then we know this drug, the ibuprofen. Now ibuprofen is an on-the-shelf uh, drug and you can buy in surplus drug. And it's available uh, under various uh, trade names such as Motrin 
or at will or things like that. Okay? Now the tool we use, so what we are trying to understand is how in order for to, to do drug delivery, you have to know how the drug is loaded and interacts with the carrier. Alright. So we do it with a technique called scanning X-ray transmission microscopy. So we bring in a 30 nanometer beam, which is very tiny. Now a human hair is about uh, 100,000 nanometer. So this is 30 nanometer. Okay, so it's a very, very tiny. And then we can look at one individual microsphere. We are not looking at the whole thing. We just look at one individual sphere. And then we can get the image before and after loading. Right? Now, of course, to do before and after loading, we have to use a similar batch. We cannot difficult to find exactly the same thing, fish them out, do the experiment, and put it back in, because this guy is only about 500, about one micron, right? But we use the same node of material, made similarly, okay? And then we can also track the chemical identity of various regions of the individual microsphere, right? For example, we can, oops. For example, we can do spectroscopy at the calcium site, at the silicon site, and then we can compare uh, their chemical uh, 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 state before and after the drug is loaded. So then from there, we can understand how the right, noise and what makes it right. a good carrier and so on. Now, and we can also, uh, because this measurement is transmission, so we can get the absolute thickness of this specimen. And by doing that, we will have a very good idea about the distribution. Is the drug loaded one way or the other on the surface or inside, and things like that, okay? So here is the map of the silicon. We are tracking the silicon absorption, which pretty much represents the, uh, the microsphere. So that gives us a distribution. The color represents the thickness. Now this is the absolute thickness because we do the experiment in transmission. Now here is the, uh, is the map of carbon, which represents the drug. It's also absolute thickness. The fact that this two maps are nearly identical indicates that the drug is not very uniform. All right? So with that, I want to conclude my talk. I want to take up this opportunity to allege, acknowledge many, many students uh, postdocs, uh, our uh, research associates, visitors who have come across, uh, come through my lab over the years. And I also want to acknowledge many, many of the Synchrotron staff uh, contributing to all this work. I, I have worked at 15 different Synchrotrons all over the world uh, over the years. So that, that's a lot of trouble. And that really means understanding by the family. We've done them, this is not possible. So, and also uh, funding uh, from all the uh, sources. And of course, I also mentioned that we have a really wonderful department for us to work. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>